Hi, so welcome everyone. Um, I guess we're all here. Um, I'm Hannah Goldberg. I'm the founder of Tanabel, which is a caterer and kind of meal delivery service based in Brooklyn. Um, we work with refugee women from all over the Middle East. Um, and this week, uh, we've had the opportunity to welcome Maggie and Layla into our kitchen with their book, um, The God's Epiphany. Um, and um, we, so for our week in the Gaza kitchen, we had two meals. We've done a Thursday dinner for two and a Saturday feast, all of which sort of explored the, the cuisine of Gaza with an emphasis on what's in season now. Um, and we've had a lot of back and forth with Layla and what's, you know, what was sort of inspired from her trips there. So um, thank you all so much for joining us for this talk. Um, the Gaza Kitchen is just out in a third edition. It came out in June of this year. Um, so we've been putting this event together for a couple of months and um, we're so excited to have this conversation. Um, oh, thanks, Lauren. Um, so um, I've introduced myself a bit. I think I'd like to let Layla and Maggie both introduce themselves and then we can jump into talking about the book. Layla? What do you want me to say? Do you want me to introduce myself? Yeah, um, introduce yourself. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know. There's not much to, to introduce. You know, Maggie and I are notorious at not knowing how to introduce ourselves. So I just, you know, um, I'm, you know, I'm a mother first and foremost of four. I live in Maryland. I'm a Palestinian from Gaza. I sort of grew up in different parts of diaspora. Um, you know, I'm an author, co-author with Maggie of the, the Gaza Kitchen. Uh, a, lot, a lot of other things that I juggle as Maggie. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Uh, you know, a lot of the work that we do, I think, in, intersects in a lot of different ways. So we're kind of double in a lot of different things. But I think we like to think of ourselves maybe as storytellers and as being able to highlight um, really those aspects of um, that are often overlooked or the voices that are often, you know, not given platforms or whatever. And I think we like to do that with the Gaza Kitchen in some yeah. way. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll say, you know, I've known the book for years I mean, since it was first published. And I think what I appreciate and why I was excited to share it with Tanabelle's audience is, you know, I think a lot of what we do is trying to kind of foster understanding, you know, particularly for our local New York audience about cultures that I think particularly for Americans can be misunderstood or little understood or, you know, vilified. And I think when we think of Gaza, you know, you think of all of these horrible images, you know, particularly that we saw this last spring and, you know, I think in the same way when we talk about Iraqi food, you know, when we do cooking classes, we like to remind people that Basra isn't just a, you know, a military point on the map, but it's been famous for dates for centuries, you know, and to give yeah. people kind of a larger context in a way of, you know, that it helps relate to, you know, the human aspect of community around food. And I think that the book does that really, really beautifully, you know, particularly in the profile. I mean, I don't know if everybody has the book, you certainly should buy it if you don't have it already. Um, but the way that it kind of profiles and takes takes opportunities to talk about and highlight different aspects, you know, both Gazans themselves and also, you know, challenges facing the, the community, I think is really... Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I mean, that was kind of the point. Um, and <laughs> yeah, and um, no, I, you're making me want now to, to eat Iraqi food. So <laughs> that's what I was thinking of while you were talking. So... Um, no, it sounds like the it sounds like the impulse or what drives Tanabel is very similar in spirit. Like the that I feel like it's like I wish we were there physically and could hang out with you and and hang out with your cooks because I feel like it's a it's very much a shared project of you know how do we use food in a way that doesn't gloss over or elide the the conflicts the real material conflicts that are there, but at the same time does use it as a sort of a bridge to. Right open conversations that might not otherwise happen and to and to seek a sort of familiarity and an intimacy um that you know other under other circumstances just doesn't arise yeah like it does around the table exactly yeah. uh, so it's sort of there's the one hand the sort of magic of the table but also i mean leila and i have had a lot of conversations which we've talked about you know the 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 premise or the axiom of hummus kumbaya, no? Like you love hummus, we I love hummus, we all love hummus. So what's the problem? You know, and it's it's not that it's not it's not, you know, 
eliminating the problem by, you know, breaking bread together, somehow things are magically solved, but rather like right. let's use food as the point of departure, the entry point to look at a lot of different things that are happening. Yeah. Um, and the and and food is such a sort of material, it's like the crystallization of ecological issues, political issues. Oh, yeah. uh, I mean, it, it, it brings together so many different things. So if we pull on that thread, we can get to lots of other issues, but we can do it in a way that's not, you know, from the sort of either the pamphlet or the, you know, sort of uh, positioned place instead, like with the, with the openness of let's sit at a table together and talk it out. So yeah. I think that's that sounds very much like the spirit of what you're doing at Tanavel, which, you know, hats off to, to you for that. I, I look forward to visiting someday and and very much what we were trying to do with the with the Gaza kitchen. Yeah, well, so I know you're not good at introducing yourselves, but can you introduce maybe give us a sense of just for people who are not already familiar with it, like kind of the genesis of the project and how you two came together um, quickly. <laughs> you want to go, Leila? Me? No, I want you to, t to talk about <laughs> yourself first. Since she made okay. me do it, you have to too. But My I mic was off, so I took advantage of the- I the saw experience. that. I know this how you quickly diverted them. <laughs> Um, Sorry, guys. I'm a, I, I'm speaking to you from a little village in Segovia in Spain, which is where I live. Um, I work as a writer, researcher, doing videos, doing sort of working in all different media, um, mostly around issues of well, all over the place, really. <laughs> I don't even know how to summarize. Recently, it's been mostly about issues of agroecology and uh, and communication about like what would a what would a just transition look like in in that regard. But but really, I've been kind of all over the place. Um, uh, very strongly from a feminist background, which is also, I think we can talk about that. Like one of the reasons why the kitchen is like this privileged place to talk from is because it is so marked as a women's space. And so you get a different side of, of history. Um, anyway, so so that's kind of where I'm coming from roughly. And uh, the Gaza Kitchen was a series of very uh, sort of serendipities, really. I went to Gaza for the first time. I had spent a lot of time in the Middle East. I lived in Lebanon for years. I was sort of familiar with the region, um, very involved in Palestine stuff. Uh, but I had not been to Gaza until actually a, a friend was joining the Code Pink delegation that was going there very shortly after the uh, the terrible bombings in 2008 and 2009. And I joined that sort of citizen delegation. It was, it was a very interesting group. It was made up entirely of people from like grassroots social movements, mostly from Miami and Orleans. Um, and, and they were going as sort of witnesses to what was happening in Gaza with a very strong sense of comparing what was happening in Gaza to to what was happening in their own sort of violently de-developed environments in, in those two American cities. So I think we're always looking for the parallel between you know, ways that de-development isn't something that just happens in Gaza, it's, it's something happening um, very violently in, in lots of places. Um, anyway, I, I joined that delegation basically to help with making a film about it. And while I was there, to listening to all of the different ways that people discuss the situation and and I just felt like like there was a kind of proximity and a kind of intimacy and a kind of uh, a sense of the place that was not being transmitted in the sort of more explicitly political uh, representations of it. And, and so I started thinking about, you know, could we just tell the story of a meal and, and put together all the pieces of like, what does it take for a family to make a meal? Like, where are these different foods coming from? Where, and tracing those, those uh, ingredients, because it seemed to me that you could really make a map of the whole situation there on the basis of, you know, tracing the, the sources for one, one meal, both the cultural and historical sources, but also, and specifically the, the material sources, like the actual ingredients. Okay. Um, so I got home from that trip and was trying to do some research to pull together an article on this and was scanning the whole internet looking for anything written about Gazan food. And the only thing in the whole vast universe of the internet, such <laughs> as it was in 2009, which was not nearly so vast as now, um, were a couple of blog posts by Leila. 
and and curious about that I sort of read through her blog and I was like wow she's cool like that this is this is the voice that we need like this is and so I, I sent her an email um saying look I'm looking at writing this article you're the only person that's talking about this what do you think and and that engendered a whole sort of email back and forth as we got more and more excited about the idea wow you could really this would be great this would be a really cool way to tell the story we had not actually met each other and that was before zoom so we were just emailing each other back and forth um and and we wrote up a whole proposal but it was kind of like a fantasy because at the time the borders were absolutely closed there was no way to get in um so it was like someday we would love to do this if we could and then i uh, then the mavi marmara event happened some of you may remember uh there was a what was called the freedom flotilla trying to enter gaza by sea um, one of the boats was uh, was arrested by the Israeli coastal authorities. Uh, anyway, in the diplomatic hullabaloo that followed, they very briefly opened the Rafa, the Egyptian access into Gaza. And Leila called me up and said, look, if you're serious about this and you really want to do it, we have to go right now because we may not have an opportunity like this. So in a matter of a couple of days, we were both on planes and, uh, and Leila got into Gaza I got stuck in Cairo for a couple of weeks Dra trying dragging to get in. my two kids with me at the time. <laughs> <laughs> right, Layla with the, with the kids. Um, and anyway, finally, I did manage to get in thanks to some some very effective string pulling uh, on the part of some acquaintance of Layla's. And uh, and and there we met on the beach in Gaza for the first time, and and we launched ourselves into this crazy. Wow. Uh, I mean, it was just lucky that we got along and we, <laughs> it, it was good. Yeah. Um, but uh, we launched ourselves into this sort of manic field work for, for I guess, six weeks in, in Gaza that summer. Yeah, and how long was that initial or that main research trip? It, it was about, I think I stayed a little bit longer than Maggie. So, so but the whole thing was about like two to three months. Yeah, two months. Yeah. yeah, two months, something like that. So it wasn't, it wasn't long, but it was literally like every day. It's insane. <laughs> we would just, we literally, I remember going from, I think it was, and, it, and for part of that time period, I was fasting the whole month of Ramadan. So it was like 8 a.m., I think, until the evening. We would come back quite late in the searing heat. It was like a heat wave. And um, so, yeah, it was pretty intense conditions. And um, yeah, now that I think back, as I was just scanning all of these various different books that have emerged since, um, I think we were really lucky. It just was total, ser total serendipity and total kind of, you know, like I said, storytelling debating. What are some different ways we can tell the story? And it just, we were lucky that we met and we both kind of um, had a sim the similar idea and that we were able to mm -hmm. present it to the world. And I always feel a little, you know, part of me like feels, okay, I think, I think if I died today, I would be happy. Like we produced something <laughs> that has, so I feel at least somewhat changed the narrative on Gaza, you know? Yeah. Um, it wasn't totally complete. It wasn't like the most maybe, you know, spectacular thing. We were, you know, two amateurs kind of, you know, um, I would faking it till we make it kind of thing, but we did it, you know, so we did something. So, um, but I, but I liked it. And I was just thinking, Maggie, what would you call this style of, um, I always struggle with this, this style of cookbook. Is it like, is it like a narrative cookbook? Is it, I know sometimes they refer to it as an ethnographic or a documentary cookbook, but, you know, I always thought like what, I always have trouble like pinpointing the, the genre that it, you know, um, that it like exists in. Um, I know there's like literary cookbooks and there's whatever, so I'm not sure, so. Yeah, I've never been much for for genres. In fact, when we were shopping the book around and trying to find a publisher, yeah, everybody looked at us all cross-eyed uh, cross because it was like, you wanna do what? Like a, a cookbook about Gaza? Um, since then, I think in the intervening yeah. 10 years, in the intervening 10 years, I think the idea of looking at just in general, the politics around food, the idea right. of looking at food as a as a place of politics, right. both as like a thing that you do politics about, but also as a way of reading politics as a sort of hermeneutic tool, tool of like, how do you understand a reality? You can, part of the story can be told through, through food. Um, I think that's developed a lot or become much more a commonplace in the last 10 years. I think when we were starting this, it still sounded really weird. 
Um, it wasn't unprecedented by any means, but some people were doing it, but, but, uh, but it sounded kind of weird. And Palestine was something that a cookbook and Gaza specifically at that moment, politically, mm -hmm like no cookbook uh, publisher wanted to touch anything like that. And then no political publisher wanted to do something that sounded as frivolous and as right. sort of banal as a cookbook, like seriously with, with the shit that's going on now, you're gonna write a cookbook. Um, so, right. so from both sides, it was uh, puzzlement and, and uh, yeah, so the genre, like the genre was never clear, but I think Leila and I from the beginning had a really clear sense of, uh, we, of what we wanted it to do. And then it was just a qu question of figuring out kind of, you know, what's the architecture of this so right. that it does that thing we wanted to do. Yeah. And I want to delve deeper into that. But I also want to say that I botched the intro. Um, we are going to talk for probably about another 20 minutes in this format. And then there's also going to be time for Q&A. So I have a lot more questions for both Layla and Maggie, but I suspect you do too. Um, so please write them into the chat and Amel is going to help us coordinate that and we're going to have a moment pretty soon where we open it up to questions. So please, please do post. <laughs> um, and also in the continued botching the um, No, the no, opening. there's no botching. There's no Fish. botching. This we, event is being recorded. It's going to be available at Just World Books um, on their Facebook page and if I can figure out how to do it also on Tannabelle's Facebook page. <laughs> so um, don't be shy, please ask your questions and we will get to them soon. Um, so back to our, our regularly scheduled programming. So you land <laughs> in Gaza for this, for this, uh, for this, for this exploration and this research. Leila, I mean, you were already pretty familiar. You'd spent time, like, did you come in and what did you bring to it already? What did you know that you were looking for? And then, you know, what perhaps on that first trip did you discover that surprised you, challenged you? I mean, you'd both spent time in Gaza, but from a food perspective. Oh, you're muted. Okay, it said host does not allow presenters to unmute themselves. That's why I couldn't do it. My daughter came in, so I quickly muted. Anyway, um, so sorry, repeat the question. I, she was saying something. It was a long one. So. What did you bring to that first trip, um, to that first uh, research trip to Gaza? Because you're already familiar, you'd spent some time in the region. Kind of, what did you bring? Did you come in with sort of an outline of things you were looking for? Oh, okay. You know, and yeah. or what kind of surprised you? What did you discover? Yeah, what, what, yeah, no, that's a good question. Direction? So, you know, I'm trying to think back to the, so it was, um, it was 2000, yeah, it was 2011, Maggie, or 10, something like 10, that. 10, 10. And, um, you know, I went, I always say every time I go back, I never know what to expect. There's always like a sort of an aura of familiarity, but some things change, some things never change. So I always try to go with like a fresh perspective. Um, and in terms of what I, you know, what I was expecting, I had certain, you know, certain dishes in mind that I knew kind of like had to be covered were sort of classics um, that I grew up with that my parents would talk about but not always make because they thought they were too weird or we wouldn't enjoy them <laughs> that other Palestinians didn't had never heard of. So they all, they were sort of in the recesses of my brain. Like, you know, why is it that like, you know, other Palestinians no, don't know about these dishes or why don't, you know, we make them as often. And I, I, it was like a little mystery to me. So I, I definitely went with wanting to know more about those dishes and, and find appropriate people who could, you know, prepare those for us that we could interview. Um, so that's kind of where we started. I had this little notebook and I said, well, I know that we have like X, Y, Z dishes, Zumagia, whatever, these we have to make. Um, and I have like a couple of contacts that are good starting points, but really that was it. We had starting points and it was like, you know, boop, 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 like three starting points that kind of one person, you know, I remember we always talk about this one incident where we met this, we went to my mother's, she was working at a clinic at the time. She's a pediatrician. And she said, yeah, yeah, you should meet so-and-so she knows how to make whatever, I can't even remember now what it was that she was, she knows how to make, but she, she's, you know, a good cook. So we went and while we were waiting and discussing, um, you know, the possibility of, you know, whatever it is, dish, somebody popped his head out. He was another doctor and he said, wait, did you say whatever it was? I think it was okra and lentils or something. 
And um, he goes, that's my favorite dish, but it's made with fava beans, not lentils. And then suddenly all these people start to, you know, uh, you know, surround us and every this heated discussion ensues about the right way to make this dish. And like everybody was so excited suddenly. So really yeah. it wasn't that difficult. We talk about how that's all it took. It just took one or two starting points. Yeah. And one person would lead us to five others, would lead us to 10 others. Right. And people were head over heels. You know, they just really wanted, it was a very passionate subject. Gaza is really known also to be sort of a, a foodie haven as, as, as Palestinian foodie havens go. They are very passionate about food. I don't know if it's a Southern thing in every country, but they love their food. They love their spices. They mm -hmm. love talking about food. They love preparing food. And in fact, it sort of a diversion, but it reminds me of where we have this guest over right now making it ish and he's, um, you know, I went and he's kind of ahead of a big, you know, um, nonprofit and he's Palestinian also. And I, I was discussing something with him last week. I saw him at this panel. And he was kind of like, yeah, yeah. And then he said, I said, uh, you know, I would love to photograph you. I'm working on this other book I, with your Mluchia. He has a huge Mluchia. And suddenly his eyes lit up and he was like, oh my gosh, yes. In fact, it's the end of the season and I would love to bring some over. So it was, that's what it reminded me of. It reminded me, Maggie, of that first time. I was like, you know, he didn't care about any political stuff. But suddenly when I mentioned Rukhia, he was like, oh, he got so excited. And so that's exactly what it was like. It was, it, it yeah. ended up being very easy. In fact, we could have gone on for months and months and collected more than, you know, um, much more than what we had here or variations yeah. or, you know. Um, so that yeah, was really, it, it, what surprised me, sorry, I didn't, just quickly, um, I know we're both kind of big mouths, but <laughs> the, what, what surprised me, I guess, was a lot of these um, s uh, sort of um, dishes that I wasn't familiar with, uh, that I best, we kind of referred to them as the farming interior dishes. And a lot of these dishes of the rural, rural Palestinian villages that used to exist around modern day Gaza that, you know, um, the, the descendants now reside in Gaza. And um, a lot of really interesting variation of uses of vegetables and grains and things that I, I didn't grow up making, I wasn't familiar with, that they themselves, you know, like each village, there would be a different regional variation um, that other Palestinians in Gaza weren't familiar with. So that to me was kind of the biggest surprise, yeah. Yeah, that's something I got a sense of in our conversations over the last month or so, and also to some extent from the book that I'd love to understand a little bit more about, like the idea of Gaza, you know, in the last 60 years, particularly as like a melting pot, and sort of, you know, my understanding is that Palestinians came from all over the territory to Gaza and, you know, kind of what does that mean for Gazan cuisine in terms of, I mean, also, I think we can back up. I think, you know, there's some questions about what defines Gazan cuisine, how, did, how is it different? But I think also, too, in a kind of confusingly complex way, it, it, it itself, both the city and perhaps also the region, because I think we use those terms sort of interchangeably, right, um, right. is also sort of a palimpsest like of its own traditions but also of what people have brought from throughout Palestine and the region too and kind of can you speak on that a little because I feel like I, I have yeah, yeah. It, but I don't really understand it yeah absolutely and but before I start Maggie you you there was something yeah. you wanted to add and I cut you off no it's fine go ahead wasn't anything well we no it was it was something related to how excited everybody gets about oh, yeah about yeah. talking about food but that's uh that's that's clear um yeah, but I mean, it's that true was that there's, pivot. Yeah. there's always this confusion when you talk about Gaza because there are at least three right. different things that get called Gaza, right? There's, right? there's Gaza City, which is a city within the Gaza Strip. There's the Gaza Strip, which is this one little territory that has a very particular regime within the sort of Israeli control and domination of historic Palestine. And then there's the Greater Gaza District, which is a historical district prior to the creation of the Gaza Strip that was much larger than the Gaza Strip, which is sort of the last little reduction of, of what that historical district was. So, um, so yeah, it is confusing and, and, and it's hard to make clear like what, which thing you're talking about when you talk about Gaza. And, and I think your question is a really good one. And, and that's sort of one of the like I would love to be able to go back and answer that question more thoroughly. In the little field work we did, we got a taste of, so to speak, a, a sense of of uh, that layered history of, on the one hand, like you have the dishes and the cuisine and the cooking styles that are uh, indigenous to or, or traditional to 
specifically Gaza City or to the greater Gaza district, but then you also have the, and, and there's some continuity in those, but then of course, like in any place, like in, the, the, the thing that's so interesting about studying food is that it's never still, like it's never, it's, and, it, and it, it then never stops, the it's always on the move, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so there's the admixture of what all of the refugees brought from their respective different parts of Palestine in in 48. And then there's the subsequent admixture since then. Lots of people are living abroad and returning. There are a lot of people working in the Gulf states and coming back. There's a lot of contact with Egypt and back. So so there are all of these different influences that come in. Um, and and I think there's a lot a lot of different layers to trace there, but one of the things that we were really surprised by and was really interesting to us was even in that maelstrom of mixture and of overlapping and of people all shoved together in extremely tight quarters uh, within the refugee camps and the cities, uh, even so there's a really astonishing level of sort of fidelity to historical recipes from your village of origin. So you have both this kind of you know, cosmopolitan or, or, or uh, cosmopolitan from below as Apatar I would say, right? Uh, this, this mixture from all over the place uh, way of cooking, but also a real sort of thread of loyalty to like very, very specific village cooking, which we found somehow especially moving because it, these are many of the villages that there's no other trace of them on earth now, you know, that, that yeah. uh, some memory work has been done, that there have been these memory books written of, of sort of trying to remember what were the streets like, and what were the houses like, whatever, but the villages, there's no physical remnant left of so yeah. many of these villages that have been completely erased. Um, so the fact that their food is still alive and being passed from generation to generation in this very like conscious and deliberate way we found mm -hmm. really moving, really like, you know, like sharing in a, in a ghost or in a, in a spirit somehow. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I, it, to hear you say that too, I mean, I think that's so much of what Tanada is about, you know, right, because the women who work with us are making the recipes of places that, you know, I mean, first their mothers and their grandmothers recipes, but then of also the places that they might not return to, right? So there's like a lot of things at work. There's also just kind of, I mean, Leila and I have spoken about this sort of the march of, march of modernity and living in the 21st century and you know like these recipes for you know pickled and stuffed and cured and you know a lot of the things we make a lot of the things that are in the book you know they're just they're traditions that are getting lost because of diaspora because of kind of the pace of modern life right and so often you know food can be a, a place where you know where these things are preserved you know and I think to that question of authenticity um, you know, it's so hard to chase, right? Because people have been, you know, particularly in the last century, moving so much in this region, or it's like, you know, our, you know, our first Iraqi cook was from Baghdad, but her grandmother was from Mosul. So really her, you know, what the core of her food was and how she associated with it was much more of the food of Mosul than the food of Baghdad, you know? And so the idea of kind of, you know, where authenticity lies, I think particularly in this region is a very, is a, is a really complex one. Um, so yeah, I, I, I respond yeah. to that. No, it's true. And I mean, we, we make a point to mention somewhere in the book, how this whole area was called, you know, Bilad de Sham, right? Gr the greater Levant, right. even though there were still obviously existing regional variations, but that whole idea of, you know, space and place is, is very fluid. You know, I, we discuss also like, you know, when you said this woman was from Baghdad and I mean, my, you know, my mother, my food is very influenced by my mother's food, who, who was influenced by her mother, who was half Circassian and half, you know, um, um, uh, Kurdish Syrian from Damascus. So she raised them, and you know, so a lot of her cooking was that. It was very specific to the Kurdish style of cooking from Damascus. Yeah, yeah, you know, and the Circassian side as well. So yeah, even though she grew up in Gaza and she was born and raised there, my grandmother, she never considered herself Palestinian. You know. Wow, right, sure. What was her favorite, what was your favorite dish that she made? Like, what's your... What's oh, she, your well, we discussed this frequently. She hated cooking. She was also a very staunch <laughs> feminist and she considered cooking like, you know, I always talk about like a step backwards and what, like, I remember the one time before she passed away that I asked her, 
how to make there's a specific thing that she they were very famous for uh, yogurt based dishes so probably my, her specialty was like my great grandmother's specialty was kubba bilaban right kubba labaniya and um but it's and shush barak and but at some point i asked her something about that and she was furious she was like is that all you think i'm good for like she knew like seven languages and memorized you know entire books of poetry and all this business at a time when that was pretty rare you know yeah. and so i never asked her again i was like okay sorry sorry you know so um <laughs> so yeah that it was um kind of a twist of fate but again for me i think food is an interesting way to approach all of these topics right not just yeah from the narrow realm of you know domestic servitude or whatever but, you know <laughs> well too i think like and I, you know i want to open it up to some questions from the audience but i just want to touch on this because i think that we did our best in putting together the menu too to sort of lard it with some well not specifically but, but um <laughs> you know some of you can some say some, the, some net it you know <laughs> well, well some net it that's clear <laughs> um so, but with, with ingredients, I mean, both seasonal, you know, things like it's the time of the olive harvest now and chard is in season. And so we made an effort sort of to highlight that. And, but, but also there are some ingredients, I think that speak to the political occupation of Gaza and things like, you know, we wanted to make sure that there was a seafood dish because we wanted to be able support right on the sea and be able to kind of talk about some of those restrictions and you know for people who are eating along who had the feast and who are snacking along with us we made the the zatar biscuits and a sachet of sage tea for people to have and i think mm -hmm. zatar is something that you know because the wild harvest is no longer a lot you know it's could you kind of speak about some of those restrictions and what food accessing it foraging it engaging with it in gaza means me well i mean i guess in general but you know I'm then also I, out I, for one second my yeah. four-year-old is calling me i think she's in the bathroom <laughs> just give me one sec keep going sure thing so maggie can you speak to some of that some of the kind of the the way that gazans are able to access and are denied access to some of their yeah, I mean, that's, there's, there, there's so many different, like every ingredient is a story. Um, and over the last 12 years or 13 years of blockade, every ingredient has been like several different stories as, as the borders open, close, uh, uh, the access is, is permitted, denied, like that's, the one thing that we can say sort of continuously is that everything is volatile, uncertain, and precarious, no? So, so the border may be open at a given moment to certain ingredients. It may not be. Um, mm -hmm. Access to fish is one of the sort of classic, I mean, as, as you mentioned, uh, ways to highlight the limits on Gaza, the, the, the maritime limit. Input previously, prior to Oslo, there was no limit to where Palestinians could fish, and G Gaza has very specifically kind of a privileged position for fishing because it's uh, nine nautical miles from a major sort of undersea trench that that migrating fish, especially sardines, like the large migrations, uh, move up and down. Hi, Bayan. Oh, I don't know why this is happening. I explained to <laughs> not to come in here. <laughs> <laughs> um so so traditionally those those fish form a very important part yeah. of the Gazan diet and also of the other Palestinian coastal cities notably Yaffa is sort of famous for its its cuisine um and then since the Oslo Accords there's been this sort of gradual reduction of access to those fishing waters um at its most restrictive, I think it was down to three miles from the coast that the boats could move, which really is like in the shallows, that's the fish nurseries. So you're fishing, you know, the tiny little, the, the uh, fingerlings or whatever they're called, um, to sometimes it's been, there's been a sort of moment of relative re relaxation and it's back to uh, eight or nine nautical miles. But in any case, like fishermen, there's a very large population in Gaza that historically, their livelihood is based on on fishing and that's just been totally unpredictable their access to actually being able to access the sea and then there's a whole sort of other industry of trying to do aquaculture to compensate for that non-access to the sea 
um, that's very interesting and, and is a sort of good alternate protein source. But as anyone will tell you, like a fish farmed tilapia is just like no, no comparison to no an comparison. actual like Mediterranean uh, fresh fish. Um, so that's one example. Another strawberries are another major example because uh, Gaza, oh, yeah. for many years, it was was being strongly encouraged. There were very strong incentives to intensively farm strawberries as a cash crop for export via Israel. Um, and a lot of farmers dedicated all of their energies to to working that that cash crop and to the exclusion of all of their other more traditional uh, crops. And, and then when the borders suddenly closed, they were stuck with a huge strawberry harvest and a whole infrastructure for strawberries, which I'm sure you know are very labor intensive. They require a huge investment to be able to set up the greenhouses and everything necessary to do the starter plants. Like it's a big project to grow strawberries. And then well, when the border addition, was suddenly right, stopped, right the water restrictions exactly. in Gaza that have only increased over the last exactly. decade. No, if you're growing uh, a cash crop like strawberries, you're basically exporting your most precious asset, which is water. No, So um, so there have been lots of different ups and downs in each ingredient. You know, Suddenly, bonanza, strawberries, got to use them before they rot in the sun. Like, What can we do with strawberries? And coming up with a thousand different things to do to conserve strawberries somehow so that that harvest isn't simply lost. Um, so yeah, each each ingredient, like when you're in such a totally volatile territory, each ingredient becomes a minor drama, uh, a whole a whole story to tell. Yeah, Layla, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, just remind me. Sorry, what was the question again? I was talking about dozen ingredients, you know, that we chose to highlight also with the feast and just what that means about restrictions and. Oh, got it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, um, um, you remind me, you made the, um, the sumagia, right? And the, the we made the sumagia, we made the zatar biscuits. We did like a sardine kofta. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, you know, Maggie's talked about the fish. I would add that, um, you know, ingredients that are, you know, uh, sort of crucial components of a lot of these dishes, like the sumagia included, like tahina, right? Like the sesame seed paste. Um, that has become increasingly, um, you know, uh, prohibitive for most of the population mm -hmm. just because of sort of the um, the, the cost uh, yeah. um, and the grinding years of blockade has made it such that when Maggie and I went, man, it was still. <laughs> I don't know why she, there nobody came to get her. There's all these people in the house and they, they just decided to let her walk into the office. Um, anyway, um, she's reading the some like it hot page, you know? So, <laughs> um, so anyway, but, but yeah, when Maggie and I were there, it was still the case that people, for the most part, yes, there was still, um, you know, uh, high rates of food insecurity and so on, but people for the most part were still managing to kind of, um, you know, cook and access these types of ingredients. When I went there two years ago, yeah, it had gone to the next point most people, yeah, most people know they would only purchase Tina. And I'm talking about the majority of the, of the population. You know, there's always going to be like 20% or so that are um, comfortable and so forth. But they would only purchase a, a meal's worth of Tina, right? So like whatever it was, you know, 25 yeah. cents, 50 cents just for that meal. So that was, that was something very um, dramatically yeah. different than before. Um, so when we're talking about Latina, which is mixed into the somagia, um, and I think in a couple of maybe other dishes, I might be mistaken, the, the sardine kofta usually has a Latina sauce in it as well. So that's a very important ingredient um, in the sort of Gazan. Well, and two, we should say, and I think, you know, we can address Adam's question from a while ago up here about talking about, you know, the, the, the ingredients in the in Gazan cuisine. I think that the tahina is, you know, an interesting one that seems pretty unique. Um, because it's roasted. So it's a much more warm, round, peanut buttery flavor than like what we often think of as tahina, like that we would put right. in our, almost our usual thing. And then also I think just to kind of telescope back for a second, garlic, chilies, injera, the dill seeds, yeah. um, you know, a, a, the whole world of fresh chilies from like a red shata to fresh green chilies, right. you know, that even, you know, when we sent our feast yesterday, we sent it with a platter and on Thursday, you know, a platter of jarjir, of arugula and spring onions and hot chilies, 
as well as like a little spicy chili sauce for people who didn't just want to munch on chili. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, you know, one way you can cut that is by adding a little lemon juice to the green right, chili. Right, so we sent a little cup of the oh, okay, okay. lemon and so people yeah. could, you know. Um, but I was saying to Maggie before 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 the event started that it's, you know, it's exhilarating. You know, I think it's cooking a lot in the flavors of the Levant. The flavors of Gaza are really specific. And I mean, can you speak just as a side note, kind of how are how, how are they different from other parts of Palestine? She's been banned from the. I ask again. I'm sorry. She's gone. No. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about the sort of hallmarks of Gazan cuisine in terms right, of right. flavors and ingredients, and then how are they different from other parts of Palestine? Do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We so, kind of talked about the melting pot, but there are. Right. I think there are distinct. Distinct. Yeah, distinct. for sure. And this is something I touched on when I talked about the ways the different um, dishes that other Palestinians I grew up with um, were making versus what we were making um, in Gaza. There's. Um, there's definitely some distinct variations. And, um, and again, not j partly because so many other Palestinians kind of piled into Gaza in 1948 in the years after um, tripling the population, bringing with them all of their, um, you know, their different kind of uh, ways of cooking and so on. And then, um, and then kept those kind of regional variations. So you see a lot of kind of um, variety in one tiny little place. Uh, but the main differences, I would say, are the abundant use of, at least if we're talking about sort of, for lack of a better term, classic Gazan cookery, right, from the, the city and other areas, towns, um, would be the abundant use of spices, chili peppers, um, and then the main main thing, I would say, dill seeds and, and you know, fresh dill. Um, that's, you know, pretty much unheard of in the rest of Palestine, but used in abundance in, in Gaza. You know, in neighboring Egypt, they would use maybe um, dill a little bit, never dill seeds, but they, they, they mm. use in Arish, in the closest town to Gaza, they'll use dill yeah. a little bit, not too much. But, um, you know, and I know Egyptians use it sometimes in their mashi. So that might have been where, you know, there and Gaza's existence along the Mediterranean, probably. Right. You know. But um, yeah, and then um, and then in terms of and then there's a lot of Gaza is really famous for a lot of these kind of what we call one pot or one bowl meals, right, where everything's kind of cooked in a pot and then um, pour it in different bowls and then eaten directly from the bowl, passed out to neighbors. There's a whole sort of genre of these dishes that yeah. you don't see elsewhere in Palestine. Um, the the use of, um, you know, and again, if we're not talking about the, the class in Gaza cookery, you, you have obviously um, the seafood is a, an important one, right? You see this obviously elsewhere along the coast, um, Akka, Haifa, et cetera. Um, in, uh, in Gaza, again, that a lot of that comes from the Palestinians that originate from Yaffa, but also from the obviously natives of Gaza itself. Yeah. Um, and it's a, a lot of it is a much more sort of uh, sophisticated style of cooking. And then you have sort of the the um, the more um, sort of the, the village style of cooking, right? Um, but even that is a little bit different. It use, utilizes a lot of the um, the local greens and then whatever happens to be in season and um, you know, generally the food tends to be very kind of, um, you know, combination of kind of piquancy, um, you know, something sort of very herby, or herb, herb, herby, I don't know if that's the right word, or <laughs> a lot of, lot of herbs and greens being used and, um, and then, you know, sort of um, citrusy and sour notes, uh, whether it's by way of the somat or the lemon or, you know, other. I don't know. Yeah, we sent lemon pickles stuffed with the shatta also as part of this oh. meal. And we wow. harvest olives so it was um yeah there's a lot of flavors and they're really bright and they're really different there is there's a lot of sour i think we noticed it cooking the sumatia yesterday you know for a dish that has lamb just a mountain of swiss chard ch chickpeas all of this and even then you finish with the red tahina you'd think it would be kind of a heavier richer stew but it's you know you make this tea out of the suma and the color is incredible it's just like this magenta right. like um and, this should, this know, should be recorded and distributed because you're the only one I've ever heard <laughs> talking so eloquently and passionately about Sumagia. <laughs> so. I, well, it was just, I mean, we don't always have the opportunity to test extensively yeah, yeah, all yeah, of the yeah. recipes before we put them on. Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, so, but for me, so you make this big stew and then at the end, you, you know, you grind in this kind of cousin trinity of dill yes. seeds and chili and garlic. And the, sum the, the, the sumac tea, because it's so sour, you know, it just lightens the whole dish. So it is, I mean, I can't say it's a looker of a dish. <laughs> that's the thing with a lot of these dishes that we struggled with is like, you know, 
a lot and of them not so photogenic. Not so photogenic. But I guess that's where garnishing comes in, which we weren't really in the business of like making dishes look really pretty. But then in retrospect, like maybe that's why people do that because a lot of I think just generally any dish is going to look kind of a lot of brown food. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, so no, I think I think that those that, you know it really does seem very distinctively cousin. But it um, is. I it's mean, a kind of it's a big sort of I call explosion of flavors, right? You have the the tartness of the sumat and the kind of nuttiness of the tina, and then the the chard and like you said the dill seeds and the piquancy of the peppers so i think that's kind of what you know um i would say is the highlight of a lot of these dishes it's just the combination of those kind of three elements you know yeah well too and i want to make sure that we make time for this because the event is about the third edition so i want to talk in our last you know 10 ish minutes or so we'll try to finish on time please too if you have any more questions do share them um but I'd like to talk about sort of your your subsequent trip in 2019, yeah. Kind of the changes over the last nine to ten years that that you that you've seen, um, and also kind of then how that affected the third edition. What's new there? Kind of how you rethought that. Yeah, yeah. So it was exactly two years ago. Um, and sorry, one second, I'm multitasking here. <laughs> um, and I went with the World Food Program. And um, I was really lucky to, you know, have the chance to go because, as anyone knows, it's never a certainty getting in or out of Gaza. So, um, I, I mean, I just like think back, and it was just an incredible, you know, that I was able to visit right also before COVID hit and everything. Um, but um, yeah, like I mentioned before, I think the biggest differences I noticed were really it was predicted, right? It wasn't like it was a shock per se, but just. Um, in terms of like just um, just sheer numbers and sheer you know stats and you know how how many people had now um, fallen into poverty and how many people were not able anymore to and it wasn't like I'm I'm, not, I'm making it not sound worse than it seems but it's not like people were sitting there going oh woe is me nobody was doing that right that so just to be clear they were all very much the same vibrant resilient like you know um, you know welcoming generous just kind of determined to um, you know, live their lives in the the best and only way they knew how. And it was a lot of, really all of them were these incredible women we met who just time and time again, you know, astonish us with their, you know, um, the way they keep these families together despite all of these impossible odds, you know, feed not only their, their bodies, but their minds. You know, this one woman was sitting there, to, you know, all her kids were there and telling me how she like reads to them and gets them books and this, this, that, and the other. That was really what was the most incredible to me. So the food was just kind of a, uh, side thing but but obviously as an observer i couldn't help but notice that nobody was using olive oil nobody was using tina nobody was using so um you know we talk a lot in the book about how a lot of the food aid staples have come to replace um the ingredients that are more sort of indigenous to the diet but really i felt like it came full circle like the thought of like this one household didn't even have olive oil, olive oil in at hand at all you know in the house and there was one dish we needed it for and i said you know i offered to go get it and they because again they just not you know unless you have someone to gift it to you it would be just too prohibitive to purchase so that was to me sort of like the 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 shocker that how many people for how many people this was now the norm right so it was like right. a sort of new normal um in Gaza well um, because too and I mean I think people know this but like UN food aid in Gaza is represents like just an enormous percentage Right. Yes. Uh, and in this case, it wasn't UN, it was World Food Program who yeah. supplements, they kind of work hand in hand, but they kind of, they kind of target the vulnerable families that aren't under the auspices of the UN, right? So these okay. people weren't registered refugees from other, they were, you know, because, you know, the way it works is you're either a descendant yourself or a descendant of a refugee, so a Palestinian who, who sought refuge in Gaza from one of these other places, right, from in 1948. Um, and then you would be a recipient of their services, including the food aid. Um, not all, right? But yeah. But then, if you don't fall into that category, but you're still um, impoverished, then you would re be receive World Food Program aid. Okay. But it's kind of like one and the same. It's just you know apples and oranges. Like one will provide. A, none of it is really a lot of variety, right? In terms of what you're yeah. being provided, you know, like white rice, white sugar, same kind of thing, um, sunflower oil or soy oil or whatever. Um, yes, but but about like you know, the numbers vary, but something between 75 to 80% um, would be food aid recipients in Gaza. So yeah. it's quite a high number, obviously. 
and to their credit, these organizations are really trying, like when we were there and, and interviewing people with various different uh, food distribution organizations, like they understand the problem with you know, massively importing food from other places that doesn't align with either the dietary needs for like a long-term emergency situation or the sort of cultural needs of this population. Like they get it. Um, and they were trying very hard to do like baskets of fresh food or try to support local produce or try to like, they're trying, but the massiveness of the undertaking to get that many calories into right. so isolated a a place with such an enormous demand um and all of those sort of ups and downs the whole roller coaster of access to funding that suddenly it occurs to trump to completely cut off funding and so then there's no money and then suddenly you know the europe coughs up some but anyway the the the, the gulf states that come and go like there's a sort of the flow of funding to be able to guarantee these like basic basic calories that are just like keeping people alive um and you know, one of the sort of alarming cynicisms of the of of the Israeli state policy towards Gaza has been, you know, they refer to it as the Gaza diet, like the, everyone will stay alive, there will be enough calories, according to a sort of calculation of minimums of, you know, how do you keep this population alive and, and keep a flow of, of calories entering into the strip that, that, you know, no one will die of starvation but everyone will eat very poorly and, and in ways that aren't yeah, that are neither nutritionally nor culturally appropriate. Right. Um, and uh, and everybody just sort of hustling to try to figure out like, what do we do with these lousy, unhealthy, irrelevant ingredients in a, in a way that we can still like recognize what we're eating and, yeah. and, and keep our families healthy. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of smaller organizations and NGOs will try to fill that gap by providing fresh you know, fruit and vegetable baskets or, you know, different kinds of small scale initiatives, you know, um, rabbit rearing or chicken rearing projects or whatever, but it's just like never seems to be enough. Um, and, and Reza is, you know, in, in the sense that they, the one thing that they do have is, is vegetables, right? Not necessarily a lot of fruits, but a lot of, you know, cucumbers, tomatoes, potatoes, watermelon, um, eggplant. Those are the things that grow in Gaza. But it's just, again, a matter of it was and this is something we talk about as well is the difference differentiating the nuance between availability and accessibility right like because for a long time, this was a thing. In a lot of ways that that a lot of polarizing debates will happen in the US the same thing was happening there like people would say detractors would say well what is everyone grumbling about like look look at the you know they would take these pictures of vegetables and the supermarket shelves look there's snickers bars and there's there's all these vegetables and, and things in the market like why is everyone saying there's no food or or Palestinians are, you know, and so that's what the nuance was, is that this blockade was and is very much um, designed, you know, was, was specifically written and designed to deprive people of the ability to access, the accessibility to what might be available, right, to impoverish people, to get to the point where they are not self-sufficient anymore, um, and always kind of having just a, in the words of, um, you know, the former head of Anira. Um, having an intravenous drip of relief always sort of coming into us so have them constantly dependent on that. Um, yeah. And these are real policies, like these are things, it's not like made up or it's not like, you know, so that's kind of what we were trying to get to the heart of that, to help people understand all of, all of this, right? Um, yeah. Well, and I think that that's what I think is so valuable about the book, right? Because I think that there's you know, obviously the resilience and the spirit and the tradition of the people and the food, you know, and then faced with these, you know, seemingly impossible conditions. And then, you know, on top of which we layer, you know, sort of a global politicization, misunderstanding about, you know, the origin of these, you know, who's, who, you know, who's to blame, who, you know, where do we assign this? And I think that, you know, it's one of the many things um, that makes the book so, such a valuable, contribution, you know, because it talks about it, but it talks about it in a way that's, I think, again, using the lens of food to universalize 
you know, some of our understanding of it and our experience, you know, that it, it is fundamentally, I think we can't talk about food without talking about politics. And it's naive to think that we can, but, you know, there are things, you know, we did a fundraiser for Gaza in June with Anera. And, you know, I think inevitably when you talk about Palestine, specifically about Gaza in, in the US, in New York, you know, the, the, you always need to anticipate a certain amount of pushback or response, you know, because it's, it's, you know, I mean, we could talk about it however we want, but it is, it's, it's controversial. And I think, you know, tempers flare about it and people have, you know, form, you know, formulated their own ideas. And I think that, you know, what we tried to emphasize there is, you know, regardless of, you know, regardless of what we see going on, there are people living in this space, you know, people who, you know, are worthy of, access to food and clean water and the ability to raise and educate their children you know there's 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 universal things that we should all adhere to right yeah. so so i think that that's you know um what a lot of the book really highlights in a really joyful balanced way right. um so thank you thank you thank you for the book well thank you for and the thank you so much for <laughs> uh, we appreciate for, that yeah i mean that's very nice much what we were aiming for Right. <laughs> We're always and like, what we, is this, does this make sense to just us or to other people? So it's always nice to hear um, some validation that we we were on the right track. <laughs> well, it does. And I think 10 years on, I think, you know, Maggie, you touched on like, it's, it was hard to place this book before. And I think now people are much more comfortable with understanding Absolutely. that food and politics are linked and that putting a recipe for, you know, um, Hannah's Molochia next to a conversation about, you know, the, you know, the restrictions to fishing, you know, it's, it, I think it, it coalesces better for people. So, um, so I want to say that for those of you, I think we should wrap wrap up. It's one o'clock. Um, but the the third edition is out. It's wonderful. Um, Layla has autographed a couple dozen copies that we have um, right here, um, and we're going to we've put together this box. So um, Gaza weekend in our kitchen may be over, but we have this ongoing offering that I think will run probably through the holidays. Um, so it's an autographed copy of the book, which is just really lovely. I can't emphasize enough how much I think you should have it on your bookshelf. Um, and we've put together a couple tastes of Gaza. So we, um, an olive leaf tea that we make, uh, the Dugga blend from Gaza, and um, a jar of Jezidia of a candied pumpkin. So it's sort of all kind of breakfasty snacky awesome. treats. So um, it's available. We ship it everywhere in the country. Um, so please consider getting that. And um, again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your questions. Maggie and Layla, thank you for your thank time you. today. And are the, is this package for those who are interested? Maybe we can also tell friends. This is on the website, on the Tanaki. Yeah, it's on the website. I think ML's going to post a link. Um, so it's up there. Um, and yeah, and we'll ship it out. We're leaving on a little vacation this week, but coming back in November, we're going to ship it, I think, November and December. It'll be available. Okay. Very good. Cool. Well, cool. thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, it was um, thank I you. Apologize for all the distractions. <laughs> She's adorable. Um, <laughs> I hope everybody has enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. Um, you and, always get hungry after you have these kinds of talks, right? <laughs> well, I still have a kitchen full of Zatar biscuits, oh. <laughs> so I'm fine. I'm fine. And some Akia. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But anyway, thanks again, and uh, we'll hope to see you all again soon. Excellent. Thank you, Hannah. And, and thanks to Tanabel for setting up this amazing uh, initiative. It's, so it's so lovely to see that the sort of the spirit of the book finds fellow travelers in this way. It's great. Yeah, well, thank you.